ಓಂ ಅಜ್ಞಾನತಿರಾಂಧ್ಯ ಜ್ಞಾನಾಂಜನ ಶಲಾಕಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರೋನ್ಮೀಲ ಏನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀಚೈತನ್ಯ ಮನೋಭೀಷ್ಟ ಸ್ಥಾಪಿತ ಯೇನ ಭೂತಲೆ ಸ್ವಯಂ ರೂಪಕದಾಮ್ಯಂ ದಾತಿ ಸ್ವಪದಾಂತಿಕ ವಂದೇಹಂ ಶ್ರೀಗುರ ಶ್ರೀಯುತ ಪದಕಮಲ ಶ್ರೀಗುರೋನ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಾಂಶ್ಚ ಶ್ರೀರೂಪ ಸಾಗ್ರಜಾತ ಸಹ ಗಣರಘುನಾಥಾನ್ವಿತ ತಂ ಸಜೀವ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತ ಸಾವಧೂತ ಪರಿಜನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣಚೈತನ್ಯದೇವ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧಾಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪಾಂಗ್ ಸಹ ಗಣಲಿತ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶಾಖಾನ್ವಿತ ನಮ ಓಂ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪ್ರೇಷ್ಠಾಯ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿನ್ನತಿ ನಾಮಿನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸಾರಸ್ವತೆ ದೇವೆ ಗೌರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾದಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯ ದೇಶ ತಾರಿಣೆ ವಾಂಛಾಕಲ್ಪತರೂಭ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧುಭ್ಯ ಪತಿ ಪಾವನೆಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭೂ ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧರ ಶಿವಾಸಾದಿ ಗೌರಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಐ ಆಮ್ ವೆರಿ ವೆರಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಬಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ವಿತ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ಇಸ್ಕಾನ್ ಕ್ಯಾಲ್ಗರಿ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ದ ಪ್ಲೆಜರ್ ಆಫ್ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅಡ್ರೆಸ್ ವೋಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಇನ್ ಕೆನಡಾ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಬಟ್ ನಾಟ್ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ಕ್ಯಾಲ್ಗರಿ so yesterday i looked up the map on the recording inter- in progress i looked up the map on the internet to see where exactly calgary was <laughs> so it must be whatever it is it must be very very cold in calgary you must be under snow right now probably in any case i think you have heating facilities so i hope you're nice and warm and going ahead enthusiastically in your krishna consciousness do you have a temple there or a center or you just meet online no maharaj we have a full grace temple oh i see i see the madhav and sinaji installed and yeah we have all the events going on and all the programs regular sunday feast program we take participation in book distribution and some kitchen outside oh. we have a website there also maharaj yeah excellent excellent very nice so very happy to hear that so please continue on and make the whole of calgary krishna conscious so i was asked to speak on the topic striking balance in life i have spoken on this topic on one or two occasions earlier in other countries and uh, maybe i can take a slightly different perspective this time and although there will be some overlap with what i have spoken earlier but let me start focus more this time on bhagavad gita verses i want to begin by narrating a little episode that happened when shri prabhupad was traveling sometime I don't remember where it was in which country but probably America and he was being driven to a public program and on the way they came to a spot where there were road works and therefore the car slowed down it had to stop and then all the cars were brought to a halt they had to wait there for some time and then nearby was a luminous sign that read temporary inconvenience permanent improvements so you might have come across this kind of sign in india we have you know inconvenience regretted and <laughs> those kind of signs everywhere so here the sign was temporary inconvenience permanent improvement So Srila Prabhupada looked at that sign and he laughed heartily and said actually that's not the case it's opposite it's not temporary inconvenience and permanent improvements 
It is temporary improvements and permanent inconvenience. It is just the other way round. That is the nature of the material world. And how right that is. In the Bhagavad Gita also, Sri Krishna declares this place to be Dukkhalayam Ashashvatam, the alaya or the abode of Dukkha or misery, Dukkhalayam, just as the Vidyalayam is the abode of Vidya or knowledge, or the Himalaya is the abode, alaya, of Him or snow and ice. So this material world is the abode of misery, of Dukkha. And it is a Shashvatam. Shashvatam refers to something being eternal, endless, permanent. And a Shashvatam is the opposite. So the material world is temporary and it is full of misery. That is the basic description of the material world. We may have so many other definitions of what constitutes this material world, but this is a very succinct and accurate description that we are living in a world that is temporary and full of misery. And we experience this in our day-to-day -day life. The various kinds of problems that we experience in terms of physical ailments, mental stress, and so many, a host of problems of this sort. From beginning to end in our life, we see that happening at the international level, national level, social level, domestic level, personal level. At every level, things are problematic. In fact, we experience that uh, the nature of the material world is quite chaotic. There is chaos everywhere. People are disturbed, they are not happy in life and things are always changing. You can always expect the unexpected. <laughs> that is the nature of the world. You can predict its unpredictability. Of course, there are certain things that are predictable like death, disease, old age. But otherwise, in terms of events that will come, they just keep changing. The situation in life is very dynamic. It is ever-changing. It's a constant struggle to avoid misery and to obtain some pleasure or some happiness. Situations often thrust themselves upon us without our having any knowledge of them beforehand. Sometimes we proactively work and there are reactions to what we do. And sometimes we simply react to situations that are forced upon us. So life is an ever-changing and complex web of actions, reactions and circumstances. Now, we are speaking about trying to find balance in such a situation. It's not an easy thing. It's something like, you know, uh, being in a boat that is in rough sea and then you're standing in that boat and you, you are expected to stand steady and stable without turning, without moving. You know, it's very difficult. Or let's say that you're in a, in a platform that is on the incline and constantly changing and you're asked to dance on that. <laughs> so it's very, it's not easy. So similarly, striking a balance uh, in this material world is difficult for this reason, because the nature of the material world is such that it keeps fluctuating. It pre keeps bringing in new things into our life. And, and therefore, we have to keep improvising we have to keep changing our strategies in life, our responses in life. So that's the first point I want to make, that we are living in a dynamic world and therefore uh, it is extremely difficult to strike a balance. But it is very important to strike the balance. So I come to my second point, 
we first discuss what exactly is balance. What do we mean by the word? Now, I'll ask you something. I, I would like you to type in the chat box one word, or you can give a series of words, but not more than one at a time. I want to, and without you looking in the Google dictionary or synonyms or anything, no cheating, just type in the chat box one word for what you think the word balance indicates. You can give two, three, four words, no problem. But they should be separate words and they just indicate what you think. Happiness, peace, stability, peace of mind. Okay. Fine. These are all alignment, equilibrium. Okay. Sustenance. Yes. Okay, that's non-duality. Wow, that is a little technical. <laughs> but it's, it's correct. Yes, non-duality, centered. Okay, fine. So there are some other, all of you have, are right. Connected, okay. Now the simple words that come to my mind when I speak of the word balance is our harmony, stability, equilibrium. So we all have a sense of what the word balance really means. Yes. So harmony, stability, equilibrium. And we see that within the body also, there is a harmony, there is an equilibrium, there is a stability, at least in a healthy body. Now let's look at it briefly from the point of view of Ayurveda. Ayurveda speaks about the three kinds of doshas within the body. You have kapha, vata and pitta. And according to Ayurveda, for good health, among other things, these three doshas must be balanced. They must be in equilibrium. And if they are not, if there is an imbalance of one or more of these doshas, then there is ill health. So therefore, an Ayurvedic physician will first of all take your pulse and try to understand which of the doshas has been aggravated or disturbed. And then try to give you some treatment which will bring those doshas back into balance. Let's look at it from the point of view of yoga, Ashtanga Yoga. And we are told in the Bhagavad Gita and in the Vedic scriptures that we have certain subtle airs within the body. They are called the prana. There are different types of pranas. And these pranas are responsible for the functioning of different systems or organs within the body. So you have a prana that that caters to the digestive system, a prana that looks after the respiratory system, and so on and so forth. So when these pranas are balanced and functioning properly, then there is a state of good health. But when these pranas are unsettled, not in a state of balance, then there is ill health. So the Ashtanga yogis, uh, they practice asanas, uh, so that the body is regulated in a certain way and very importantly they practice pranayam, process of breathing in and out in a certain regulated manner. And that sets right the pranas, it balances the pranas in the body and restores one to good health. So these are only two examples, the one can give innumerable such examples of how balance is required for stability and good health physically, mentally and even at the level of the cosmos. For example, if the sun and the earth are at a distance that is a little more than what we have now, then it will become very, very cold and we will all freeze to death. If it's closer, then we will all burn to death. There will be no 
life as we know it on earth in such a place. So, uh, by Lord Krishna's arrangement in this universe, the distance between the earth and the sun is within a certain acceptable range, a range that permits the sustenance of life as we understand it in our kinds of bodies on this earth planet. So there is a balance. If you go beyond a certain range called the range of balance, then there is instability and in fact one can even say there will be destruction. So imbalance leads to illness, ill health, it needs to disturbance and it can even lead to destruction. And health, or rather on the other hand, balance leads to happiness, stability, equilibrium, sustenance, and many of the nice words which some of you said. So this is the second point that I want to make. That is what actually balance means and why balance is important in our life. The third point now I want to make is in terms of physical balance and mental balance. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna speaks in the sixth verse about how a, a yogi should be. Yukta hara viharasya, yukta cheshtasya karmasu, yukta svapnava bodhasya, yogo bhavati dukkha. He says that if one, if a yogi in particular wants to be free from misery, then the yogi must regulate life, his or her own life. The word yukta, Srila Prabhupada explains, means to regulate or to control or to be moderate or to be restrained or to be temperate. So unless there is some regulation or control or moderation in the things we do, we cannot expect freedom from misery. So what are the things in which Krishna says in the 6th chapter, 17th verse, that we should have some moderation and temperance? First he says, Yukta Ahara. Ahara means food. Vihar, that means recreation. Cheshtasya Karmasu, in all our activities, in the performance of our prescribed duties, in our general daily activities in life and yukta svapna avabodhasya so in our dreaming and deep sleep that is in our wakefulness uh, on one hand and avabodhasya also in our wakeful state so in our sleep our wakefulness so there has to be regulations there has to be control and moderation in all these different activities of life in fact in the verse previous to this krishna has already stated that there is no possibility of one becoming a yogi if one eats too much or eats too little or if one sleeps too much or sleeps too little. In other words, we are speaking of a complete sense of balance in the body. Now for those of you who are familiar with the Bhagavad Gita, who have been studying it for some time, you are quite familiar with the concept of the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Sattva, Sattvaguna, Rajaguna, Tamaguna. The word Sattvaguna indicates, among many things, stability, peace, happiness, and in our context, balance. The word Rajaguna implies a state of constant flux, where everything is moving because people want to enjoy, they want to have more and more. So there is a kind of restlessness. Now this restlessness may sometimes be used for a good purpose, but too much of that restlessness will actually cause imbalance and harm. Because some, sometimes creativity also needs some restlessness. And without creativity, what would life be in this material world or anywhere? So some degree of the mode of passion is good, but too much of it is not good. Just like salt. You know, without salt, 
you know, uh, without a pinch of salt, the food taste stays uh, very bland. You don't like it. But if there's too much of salt, then that's not good either. So the mode of passion is required to some degree for certain types of activities. And the mode of ignorance, it causes destruction. It represents not just sleep and indolence, ignorance, but also destruction. So when we speak of trying to find a balance, we speak of trying to nourish and facilitate the mode of goodness, the sattva guna. So for those of you who are new, who are perhaps not familiar with the concepts of the three modes, uh, maybe sometime uh, you've heard these classes in your temple in Calgary and maybe there can be some classes in future on that topic. You'll get a better idea of what these three modes are. But suffice it to say that for a balance on the physical platform, in terms of the physical body, we need regulation of eating, sleeping, acting, recreation and so on. And obviously this also indicates that there must be a certain kind of conducive environment to facilitate this physical balance. So you need to be in a place that is sattvic. You need to be surrounded by people who are a little sattvic. Uh, you have to have uh, a lifestyle that is somewhat sattvic. Otherwise it will be difficult to strike that balance. And if you don't strike that balance, then there is imbalance, which means ill health at a physical level. Then there is the question, next point, is the question of balance in mind. It's not enough to balance the body physically. We must also have balance in mind. And that actually, according to Bhagavad Gita, in the second chapter, 48th verse, Krishna defines what yoga is. There are various definitions of yoga that Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita. There are different types of yoga and each has a certain definition. And in the second chapter, Krishna says, Yoga staha kuru karmani sangam tyaktva dhananjaya siddhya siddhyo samobhutva samatvam yoga uchyate. So he says, Arjuna, being situated in yoga, yoga stha, kuru karmani, perform your prescribed duties. So act being based in yoga. And simultaneously, sangam tyaktva, give up attachment to this material world. Give up attachment to what? Siddhi, asiddhi. Give up attachment to success and failure in the execution of your prescribed duties and in doing whatever it is that you have to do in this world. Samo Bhutva. So be equipoised and samatvam yoga uchyate. So this kind of equanimity, this kind of mental balance, this kind of mental equilibrium or harmony is what is referred to as yoga by Krishna in this verse of the Bhagavad Gita. So we have to be fixed in the right kind of work, in the right manner, with the right mentality or the right approach. So in the ever disturbing and changing nature of this material world, uh, so therefore equilibrium and balance refers not just to uh, the physical balance or the equilibrium but also in the mind. And as you know, by experience, uh, most of the problems arise because of the troubles in the mind. It is a mind that is a source of the greatest imbalance to us. So Krishna has given us a hint of how we should cultivate the quality of samatvam or equanimity. He, he sheds further light on the subject of mental balance in the sixth chapter again, after having described the process of Ashtanga Yoga, the eightfold process of yoga that involves, among other things, you know, performing asanas and pranayama and dhyana and so on, 
He speaks of controlling the mind. And Arjuna says that that's impossible. Chanchalam hi manaha krishna pramati balavadridam tasyaham nigraham manne vayuri vasudushkaram So Krishna, what you're saying is, is very, very difficult to achieve. It is more difficult to control the mind than it is to control the raging wind like in a tornado or a typhoon. Because the mind is extremely restless, turbulent, obstinate. So what prevents uh, the state of mental balance is, number one, that the nature of the conditioned mind is to be out of balance. The very nature, the dharma of the unconditioned, of the conditioned mind rather, of the non-spiritual mind, the very nature of the non-spiritual mind is to be restless and out of balance. So therefore Arjuna is asking a question on behalf of all of us. And he's saying it's, it's impossible to do that Krishna. So Krishna gives him and through him to all of us an assurance in the next verse. And he says, A sanshayam mahabaho mano dur nigraham chalam abhyasena tu vairagena kutu kaunteya vairagena cha grihyate. So he says, yes, what you're saying is correct, Arjuna. It is indeed very difficult to bring about that state of mental balance, but it is not impossible. It is possible. And possible by what means? By two means. Abhyasena tu kaunteya vairagena cha grihyate. So he uses two words here. Abhyasa and vairagya. Abhyas refers to adopting certain practices and Vairagya refers to renunciation or giving up certain practices or certain habits or certain activities. So we must accept some things and we must give up some things in order to achieve the state of mental balance. Now this form of um, these two, the duality of accepting some things and giving up some things is something we experience in our day-to-day -day life as well. For example, when you go to a doctor with a certain complaint, then the doctor usually gives you two types of instructions. The first type of instruction is that you have to do something. You have to take this tablet, you know, at such and such time and you have to take a particular kind of food. You have to do a particular kind of activity. So these are the do's that the doctor prescribes. But the doctor also gives us a, a series of don'ts. You don't do these kind of activities. You don't eat fried foods or you don't eat uh, sweets for some time or whatever it may be. So whenever we want to restore a sense of balance from an existing state of imbalance, two things are required, do's and don'ts, both at the physical level and at the mental level. And we see this even in the process of bhakti. We follow bhakti yoga. We are not so much into uh, karma yoga and ashtanga yoga because these processes the the perfection of karma yoga and ashtanga yoga and all other forms of yoga are to be found in bhakti yoga so we have all heard of this uh, the phrase that Srila Prabhupada used to say uh, many times always think of Krishna never forget Krishna smartavya satatam vishnu vismartavyo Na jatu chit, sarve vidhi nishedhasyur etayor eva kinkaraha. He says that we should always remember Krishna, we should never forget Krishna. Now the question arises what does it mean to always forget Krishna and never, to always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna? Don't these mean the same thing? 
if you're always remembering Krishna, then certainly you're not forgetting Krishna. So why this repetition? If you say you never forget Krishna, then you obviously imply that you should always remember Krishna. So why has it been said like this in two different ways? It's an interesting question. In fact, in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the nectar of devotion, this verse has been cited by Srila Rupa Goswami to illustrate the process of Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. Vaidhi Bhakti is the process that a beginner in Bhakti follows. Uh, a neophyte devotee follows Vaidhi Bhakti. Of course, the regulations go on till a fairly advanced stage, a very advanced stage even. They are required to be followed by the sadhaka or the practitioner. So Srila Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur, he mentions here that why would such a verse be mentioned by Rupa Goswami for a beginner? If somebody is very new to Krishna consciousness and you tell him or her, you always remember Krishna and you never forget Krishna, that person will say, that's impossible. I'm just a new person. I, how do you expect me to always remember Krishna? I'm doing my various activities in life. So Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, then this might even lead that neophyte devotee to lose faith in the scriptures and the acharyas. Because the neophyte devotee might think this kind of instruction is completely impractical. How is it expected of a new devotee like me to always remember Krishna, never forget him even for a moment? Is it practical? Is it realistic? No. So because a neophyte devotee might develop doubts of this kind and lose faith, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur gives us a purport of what this means. He said that we must perform activities that help us to remember Krishna every day. And we must avoid those activities that prevent us from forgetting Krishna every day. So he's speaking of a daily, that we must do things on a daily basis. For a newcomer, we can't expect that new devotee to remember Krishna and not forget Krishna at every moment. But at least, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, we must perform activities every day on a daily basis rather than on a basis of every moment. We must perform activities every day that will help us to remember Krishna. And we must act avoid activities every day that will prevent us from forgetting Krishna. And in this verse, Srila Rupa Goswami uses two words, Vidhi and Nished. Sarve vidhi nishedhasyur etayor eva kinkaraha. So he says these two rules to forget to always remember Krishna and never, never forget Krishna are actually the master. All the other rules and regulations and the do's and don'ts that you find in the Vedic scripture are simply kinkaraha. They are servants of these two principles of always remembering Krishna and never forgetting Krishna. So what are the vidhis and what are the nishedhas? Vidhi means do, the do's, they are the rules. So you do this, you do this, you do this. You chant at least 16 rounds of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra every day. You take prasadam, you worship the deity, you take darshan, you study and hear the Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita and so on. So these are the vidhis, the do's that we need to do on a daily basis. There are also the nishedhas, the prohibitions, that we, the don'ts. And the don'ts are essential for us to do as much as the do's are. For example, we don't eat meat, we don't gamble, and so on. So there are do's and don'ts. So there is vidhi and there is nished. So the vidhis represent the abhyasa that Krishna refers to in that verse. Abhyasena tukonteya vairagena chigrihyate. 
So the abhyas means that you have to practice doing the do's, practice following the rules of chanting, hearing, reading, worshipping, etc., etc. And the vairagya or the renunciation refers to abstinence from, keeping away from the harmful activities like taking intoxicants, eating meat and so on and so forth. So in order to attain the proper balance, not just in our, uh, on, in the platform of the physical body, not just in the platform of the mind, but even in the platform of the soul, when we perform Krishna consciousness, it is essential for us to do these things. Now, of course, as I was mentioning briefly earlier, the other yogas, they uh, are important um, insofar as they are supposed to bring us to the point of Bhakti Yoga. All the ideas of yoga culminate in Bhakti Yoga. The word yoga comes from the word yuj, which means to link. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has already explained, Yogi nama pisarvesham mad gatenantaratmana shraddhavan bhajate yomam same yukta tamo mataha. He says in the last verse of the sixth chapter, which is about Ashtanga Yoga, that yes, Arjuna, I have described to you previously various types of yoga. I have described Karma Yoga, and Sankhya Yoga, now Ashtanga Yoga, etc. But let me tell you that the highest yogi, the topmost yogi is one who always thinks of me, who, whose mind and consciousness abides in me. Yoginam Api Sarvesham. Sarvesham means all. Yoginam means the yogis. So amongst all the yogis, the topmost Yuktamo, Tamo Mataha, Tamo means the topmost one in my opinion, Krishna, is that yogi who Mad Gatena Antaratmana, inside, within himself or herself, always abides in me. Mad Gatena, or always thinks of me. How? Shraddhavan, with faith. And it's not just an idol. Idea, uh, idle thinking of Krishna or abiding in Krishna. It is an active abiding in Krishna. Bhajate yomam. So the word bhaja refers to two things, to love and active service. <coughs> <coughs> so Srila Prabhupada has defined the term bhakti not only in terms of love, but as an active process. And therefore, the term that he used for bhakti was devotional service. It's not only devotion. So, Srila Prabhu, Prabhupada wanted to emphasize that the process of loving Krishna is an active process in which we have to act with love, with faith, for the pleasure of Krishna, for the sake of developing love of Krishna. So, therefore, Loving service to Krishna is the, the perfection of life. So therefore the balance of body, balance of mind are necessary, but they are not ends in themselves. Remember, Krishna is speaking about different types of yoga here. If you keep aside the topic of balance from yoga, then such balance is meaningless. There are people in the material world who perhaps strike the right balance physically. They're situated in the mode of goodness. There are some people who perhaps strike the right balance on the mental platform. But if they don't come to the highest spiritual platform of bhakti yoga, then they will not be able to strike that balance on the spiritual platform. And without that, in the long run or even in the short run perhaps, they will not be able to sustain that physical and mental balance. So it is very important that we have to see the word balance in connection with the word yoga and ultimately in connection with bhakti yoga. 
So therefore, the next point that I'm driving at is that we need to connect the process of balancing with uh, the process of loving Krishna. Now externally, superficially, we see so much chaos and disorder in the world. We see an impermanence of things. We see that things are constantly changing. Phenomena are transitory in nature. But underlying all this superficial chaos, there is, from Bhagavad Gita we understand, a supreme order, a, a sublime plan, a transcendental purpose. And that is Krishna's plan for us to become pure devotees of His. And to then escape from this material world and go back to the spiritual world and be with Krishna eternally in his pastimes. That is the ultimate goal and the perfection and the purpose of our life. So if we do not connect the process of balancing our daily life, the physical, the mental and so on, with this ultimate goal, that balance will not be very meaningful. And of course, because the world we live in is ever-changing and transitory, so the kind of balance we have to have is also very dynamic. A dynamic situation or circumstance requires a dynamic response. So therefore the balance that we have to strike in this material world must necessarily be a dynamic balance, not a static balance. A static balance is when everything is stationary around you and there is motionlessness. Yes, but the world is not like that. Everything is always on the move. Everything is ever changing. So, I will compare the process of trying to strike a balance in the material world with the process of driving a car. Now, this is an example I had given in uh, one of the earlier lectures on the same topic I had given some years ago. This concept of balance being compared to the driving of a car. Now, when you drive on a car, uh, drive a car, then you have to be very alert at all times. You have to be careful that uh, you have a car in front of you, on the left, on your right, a car behind you. You have to be careful about signals. You have to be careful about left turns and right turns. You can have to be careful about speed limits. So when you drive a car, you are constantly negotiating or navigating the, uh, the road. Sometimes you turn left, sometimes right, sometimes you slow down, sometimes you speed up, sometimes you stop, then you start again, then you make a U-turn sometimes. So you have to do all these things. So if you don't navigate the road in this way, in a careful way, then you will never be able to strike the balance. Then you will have an accident somewhere and that will cause a disturbance. So lack of alertness, a lack of <clears throat> balance in the process of driving the car will lead to an accident. It will lead to damage uh, and in an extreme case, it may even lead to death and destruction. So balance involves understanding how to drive a car and to be alert. Hmm? Here in the highways in India also, we have all sorts of posters put up, you know, signboards put up at different locations to encourage drivers to be very alert. And one just outside the place where I live in, in the highway, it says in Hindi, Dhyan Hati Durghatna Ghati. So, if your attention wavers, dhyan hati, if your dhyan, your attention to the driving or to the road wavers, then durghatna ghati, then you may have a calamity taking place, a misfortune happening there. So, in the process of striking the balance, one has to be very alert and one has to be equipped with the skills that are required to keep the car in proper motion. 
So also, we have to understand the proper skills required, how to eat properly, when to eat, when to sleep, what kinds of foods to eat, what kinds of activities to engage in, on the spiritual platform, mental platform, physical platform. So these are skills we will have to learn. At the same time, I asked this question in that earlier lecture. When you drive a car, you need to know many things. You need to know the technical skill of driving the car. You need to know all the rules of, of the, that are imposed by the traffic authority. But what is the most important thing that you need to know when you're driving a car? I'll ask you to type. Just in two or three words maximum. What is the most important thing you need to do or you need to know? Okay, awareness, all right. Of what? Control the car, okay. Fine. What else? Where are you going? That's the question. Uh, that's the answer I was looking at. So being aware, being alert, having control of the car, you know, all of that is absolutely correct. But imagine a person who is an expert driver of a car and he or she is driving around Calgary, perfectly driving, following all the rules of the Canadian Traffic Authority, the exemplary perfect driver whom the Canadian Traffic Authority puts forward as a perfect example of a driver. But you ask that person, my dear sir, where are you going? He says, I don't know. Now you're going to be surprised at this answer and you think, well, you need to be placed under some other kind of authority now. If a person doesn't know where he or she is going, he's sitting in a car, perfectly driving, completely obsessed with the minute of, of the rules and regulations and being aware and controlling the car in the proper way, but that person doesn't know where he or she is going. Why am I sitting in the car? Why are you there, my dear sir or madam? Oh, I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. So what is the use of driving your car perfectly when you don't know where you are headed? So similarly in life, at the physical and mental level, we may have, we may be doing all the right things and striking some balance in life. But we don't know the purpose of life. We don't know where we are headed. We don't know where we should be going. What is the ultimate destination of life? What happens after death? Is there a next life? So if we don't know the answers to these questions, then what is the purpose of all that balance? And therefore the significance of the word yoga. So therefore, we have to connect up all the skills that we require to live within this world with the activities of pure Krishna consciousness, like chanting our japa, doing kirtan, reading and hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, etc. And then pull together, all of these constitute the different departments of our life. And then we have to find the balance in all these different departments and make sure that we're doing justice to each of these departments. What are the different departments in our life? We have number one, the health department. <laughs> number two, we have the family department. Number three, we have the social department. Number four, we have the professional department. Number five, we have the financial department. And number six, most important of all, we have the spiritual or devotional department. And even within the spiritual department, there are so many sections, sub-departments. There is a sadhana department. 
within the sadhana department there are further sub departments there is the chanting japa department there is a reading prabhupad book department then apart from the sadhana department there is a seva department perhaps you do some seva for the deities perhaps you clean the temple perhaps you're making some outfits or jewelry for the deities or doing some other kind of seva there is a preaching department so all these departments are part of the spiritual department so even within the spiritual department you have to balance it all out if you're only preaching 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 but not chanting your rounds not doing some uh you know other spiritual service that's not going to go very far if you are doing a lot of sadhana you are preaching nicely but you don't take care of your health there's going to be difficulty it's going to make you stop your preaching and it's going to interfere with your sadhana you're doing your uh you're you taking care of your health you do taking care of the spiritual department but not giving attention to your family then there would be a disturbance there if you're doing all these things but you're not paying attention to your job you have to leave your job and you have no money to run your family that's going to be another problem so all these departments need to be given due attention they have to be uh, given the if we have to make priorities in life and accord priorities to each of them the spiritual life department is obviously the most important priority and everything else all the other departments must be organized around it it's not that you should neglect them it's not that you should be irresponsible about them but you must see them in connection with the most important department of life which is your spiritual department the other departments exist to facilitate the development of the spiritual department but without neglecting those other departments without being careless and irresponsible about them so just because you are a devotee you should not be neglectful and careless about your health about your family about your financial matters and so on at the same time in the name of looking after and fulfilling your responsibilities of the world in the finance department family department you should not neglect your spiritual life so therefore balance means that we accord the proper priority to the departments uh in terms of how much priority they deserve and how important they are sorry this has come off so i just have to yeah so we have to accord priority in terms of how important these different sections are and because <clears throat> they are uh you know always changing so like when you drive a car you have to keep moving left and right and slow and fast so you have to sometimes fluctuate between these different departments on some occasions you give more importance to the family and perhaps you're not able to do something else you don't go to your work on that day it's a holiday you gave more time to the family but then you can't do that every day then you have to go to work so between these amongst these departments you have to make <clears throat> an adjustment so sometimes you give more priority to this sometimes more to that sometimes more to this so that overall you are giving the adequate attention that is due to each department so it's a dynamic balance that may not be possible to strike at every single day of your life you should try to but even if you can't strike that balance in all these six departments of your life on a daily basis at least make sure you strike it over a few days maximum a week for example it's good that you should read shri prabhupada's books at leisure every single day but even if for some reason you're not able to do it on a particular day because of some emergencies or something else make sure you catch up and some other time of course there are certain activities which we can never compromise 
we have to be do that on a daily basis like chanting our rounds our japa and so on those have to be seen on a daily basis so in any case to conclude i will say the key to balance is to do the thing that is required that is the right thing at the right time in the right way with the right mentality whether it is sleeping chanting uh, or anything else do what is needed to be done at the time that it needs to be done in the right manner and with the right consciousness and then we can strike a proper balance so uh, remember it's a dynamic balance so you have to be constantly alert that the balance has to be maintained reasonably and when you're off balance you have to restore that balance so it's like a car going on the road the destination is clear but you're moving left right changing lanes but coming back to your lane but always keeping the destination in mind and at the same time making sure there's no accident that happens or that you don't break any of the rules of the traffic authority hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 hare hare so i had been asked to speak for 1 hour and i have exactly spoken for 1 hour so the sense of balance i think i have maintained hopefully uh because balance also means sticking to the time so doing it exactly at the right time so i think we have some time for questions yes yes ma'am okay how much time do we have for questions yeah if you are okay with 10 15 minutes okay so then those who have questions can raise your hand and you can unmute and uh, then ask the question right so maybe shubhankar krishna prabhu you can call out whoever is asking and whoever wishes to ask okay Yeah, Tarikh Adish, Prabhuji, you want to ask? <laughs> ask later, Prabhuji. Um, I'll just give a chance to our new students. Sorry? I didn't hear that properly. no he is saying that to give the chances to our new youth okay okay so let's see if somebody has a question if anyone has a question please send it's a good opportunity to ask questions directly to maharaj please don't speak usha cham charan pro please um, yeah go ahead Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not at uh, that much young, but I'm new, so I think I qualify. So we are so, all young. We are the spirit soul is eternal, is always young, ever fresh. Yeah, yeah, right. The, the yeah. material body may grow old, but the soul is ever ever youthful. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Uh, surely. so uh, my question is like uh, you discuss about the sadhana department and you also mentioned uh, that okay uh, chanting is the priority what should be the different priority in that sadhana department i'm i'm new i'm a, i'm still asking so yeah the sadhana department the most important thing is to chant your japa the prescribed rounds at least every day to do it in the right way whatever the number of rounds that you're chanting if you're new if you're not chanting the prescribed minimum 16 rounds every day then whatever rounds that you are uh, chanting right now 
whatever is the minimum that you have decided for yourself, at least do that much. At the same time, in order to continue that consciousness and that determination to continue chanting, we have to hear also. So I would say that hearing and chanting are the two most important activities in our life. Nothing is more important than that. That is not to say that the other things don't have importance or significance. But these are the two most important activities. So you chant your japa and that's the first thing. And also do kirtan in the house and at the temple and at devotional gatherings. And also hear, hear the lectures. So reading Srila Prabhupada's books is also a form of hearing because we are hearing Srila Prabhupada speak through his purports. Any other question? Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Yes, please go on. Purushottam Chandra Prabhu. Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, thank you for uh, the wonderful lecture. <laughs> Um, I wanted to know, sometimes, you know, we feel a bit stagnant in our spiritual life. So we are doing our rounds and we are doing our reading, but how do we increase the quality um, of our spiritual life? Because sometimes we feel we're just going through the motions and uh, the nectar that we used to initially get is sometimes not there anymore after after a little while in Krishna consciousness. So how do we maintain that and how do we um, increase the quality? By focusing on the purpose. By keeping that in focus all the time. Why am I chanting? Why am I doing devotional service? Why am I here? Keep that focus. And in order to ensure that the focus continues, you need to hear, you need to associate with devotees. And we encourage each other to keep that focus. That stagnancy is the natural tendency of this world. So we have to encourage each other in the association of devotees to come out of that comfort zone, of that stagnancy. So hearing and associating with devotees and keeping that focus on the purpose will help us to keep our Krishna conscious activities fresh. Thank you, Maharaj. Monica please. Uh, actually, this is neat. Oh, <laughs> Prabhuji? Yeah. I'm using Monica's uh, uh, ID. So, so Prabhuji, I have a question regarding uh, Bhakti. I'm also new to, you know, uh, Krishna consciousness. And I've been attending few classes like on Zoom in uh, uh, Iskong Lucknow and Ayodhya. And uh, I do attend uh, some Bhagavatam uh, classes as well. Uh, so my question is basically like uh, one of the things, one of the in one of the lectures I heard like you know, uh, ch ch uh, in addition to the chanting and uh, yoga, if uh, like you know uh, chanting of Gayatri mantra enhances or it acts as a catalyst, which confused me a bit. So you know, is it true like if we uh, chant Gayatri mantra along with the Hare Krishna mantra, would it enhance or speeden up my process in uh, bhakti? Actually, the Hare Krishna Mahamantra is a stand-alone mantra. Okay. Which means it's an independent mantra. It is not dependent on any other mantra for effectiveness. At the same time, the only mantra which we actually use for helping us chant better 
is the Panchatattva Mantra, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhar, Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda, in which we invoke the mercy of the Panchatattva led by Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because the Mahamantra has been specifically uh, promoted by Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as a means for obtaining Krishna Prem in this age. And because Kali Yuga is such a difficult age, so we need the mercy of the most merciful incarnation of Krishna, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So before we chant our rounds, our Kirtan, we chant the Panchatattva Mantra. But otherwise, the Hare Krishna Mahamantra is independent. It does not require the chanting of any other mantra. However, there are other mantras that may supplement the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Now within our institution, ISKCON, when devotees take the second initiation, then they are also given certain mantras, the Gayatri mantras. There are different types of Gayatri mantras that are given. And the devotee then chants those Gayatri mantras three times a day. And that has its own purpose. It's a topic in itself. But that also helps to purify the mind, to focus the mind on um, the... Uh, there are, each of the mantras have different purposes, but they help us to focus the mind on that purpose. And it brings us to a platform of sattva, so that we can chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra better. And uh, so that mantra we can chant after second initiation. But our primary mantra will always remain the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Thanks, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Pradesh. Oh, please go ahead. Unmute yourself. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, Hare Krishna. I would like to ask a question like uh, while, do, uh, while, while maintaining stability in our life or while maintaining stability in our sadhana itself, at times we dwindle here and there, and at times maintaining stability is very difficult. And you even get failures. So, uh, and you and you may even get depressed at times. So, how to deal with that? But I guess, like you mentioned, like maintaining the focus on the destination itself answered a little bit. But if there is something more elaboration, can you please do that? The nature of this material world is that it always agitates us and depresses us. That's the way this world has been designed. So we should not expect that things will always be, <clears throat> as you say in Canada and America, hunky-dory. <clears throat> things will not be like that. So the mind will take us on a roller coaster, sometimes up and down and up and down. That is why Krishna says, Samatvam Yoga Uchyate. So we have to learn that to develop that equanimity of mind. And that comes by the cultivation of sattva gun, mode of goodness. So if our lifestyle is situated in the mode of goodness, then it's much easier to maintain that sense of balance in the mind <clears throat> and not sometimes get depressed and sometimes get elated too much. Hmm? Because we're human beings, we may get a little depressed sometimes, we may feel a little happy sometimes, but we should not let that persist. By strong spiritual practices, by strong spiritual association, and by use of our intelligence, we should snap out of that tendency to go into some depressive mode or to be in a mode that is too elated. Okay? So good association and strong hearing and chanting and leading a sattvic lifestyle. These are very essential for us to be able to surf the waves of uh, the material world. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, Prana. Hare Krishna. Okay. <clears throat> so Hare I think. Krishna, you have more question? Uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. I have a question. Sorry, I cannot raise my hand. I could not find the button. Okay. Dhanvat Pranam. Hare Krishna. Uh, 
but talking about uh, the importance of sadhana and japa uh, for i example uh, do 16 rounds every day but they say that the hari naam has uh, you know the nectar is too high but of course i am too neophyte that i have no taste and because of that it feels mechanical most of the time and because it feels mechanical that you have to do it the taste you know further downgrade so it feels as if yeah it becomes a work you know instead of <laughs> joyous activity that uh, bhakti should be so how can i train my mind that you know the nectar will come one day and i have to have patience and i still need to continue that because even though i do 16 but the quality of my 16 is i would not say the best of my abilities so it's very bad how do i improve that and how do i maintain the patience and enthusiasm in bhakti to continue this is a <clears throat> a very common problem that uh, <clears throat> all of us face as devotees so if it's of any consolation it happens to most devotees uh as i said in a, in an answer to an earlier question that the way to prevent things from becoming mechanical and stagnant is to keep the focus on the purpose why are we doing all this to remind ourselves it's not that we don't know it's not that we have forgotten but it's just that it goes to the back of the mind so we have to bring it to the front of the mind we keep that focus strongly number 1 number 2 we keep hearing and we keep associating because if you're not associating with devotees regularly and hearing about krishna and chanting about krishna then we will be associating with non devotees and even if you're not associating with non devotees we will be associating with our conditioned mind so therefore to keep ourselves fresh and active and alive in our krishna conscious practices we have to keep constantly associating with devotees hearing chanting focusing on our purpose and engaging in some variety of activities also that may help to give some freshness uh, have some have some concrete activities that you will do for krishna service have some little or big projects that you will do for krishna service have that excitement in your life that you want to do this for krishna you want to do that for krishna and that will give you some zest some fervor and that will then give you the enthusiasm to chant your rounds nicely also so we are not like haridas thakur or we can just sit at one place and chant maybe 180 rounds every day hmm? so we need to be engaged in a variety of activities our senses need to be engaged so some variety is helpful so if that variety is in krishna's service then that is very good and also make sure you take care of your health you're doing some yoga some exercises that will keep you also enlivened and enthused so in this way by following an essentially sattvic regulated lifestyle and doing your krishna conscious practices in the association of devotees you can keep yourself um fresh in your krishna consciousness okay so i Thank think you so much okay so i think uh we'll stop here and i offer my best wishes uh and greetings to all of you uh i hope and pray that the activities in iskon calgary will um move from strength to strength and that we'll have many many pure devotees coming out of calgary and expand your outreach activities and live together in a community of devotees with great uh, uh, friendship and keeping krishna firmly in the center with strong emphasis on hearing and chanting 
and a humble service mood. Thank you all very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yeah. Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Bol. Hare Krishna.